really matters? That might be the most important question you can ask. So let's talk about it. Welcome to What Really Matters podcast, Everyday Spirituality with Karen Wyatt. Thanks for joining me here today. I'm glad we're spending a little bit of time together once again. And today I'm back to my task that I've been pursuing much of this year so far, which is answering questions that people most frequently ask in Google. So these are questions about life and death and things that people are searching for. And Google produced this list of things that I I went through and found all the questions that I thought were really interesting to try to answer myself and see if I could come up with explanations or some sort of an answer. Not that I'm any kind of expert or authority, more that I'm answering these questions about life based on my own experience, what I've lived and learned through my studies and through my work. So the question to consider today is, what is it like to die? And of course, I'm a retired hospice physician. So this is a subject I know quite a lot about in terms of both studying academically, but also through personal experience. I've sat at the bedside of hundreds of people as they were dying. So I've witnessed dying many, many times at least dying when it occurs naturally, gradually, and slowly when someone is dying from old age or from chronic illness and disease that tends to take life over time. The other type of dying that we're all aware of, of course, is sudden death, which can happen from a heart attack, say, a a sudden physical event, heart attack or stroke, or could happen from some type of accident or other mishap. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but I've witnessed that happening much less frequently than the slower, more gradual dying process that I have experienced in hospice. So I'll be talking about the things that it's possible to witness when you're with a person who is dying from the outside, primarily physical changes, but also some of the things that my dying patients have described to me that they're experiencing internally, emotionally, but also spiritually while they're in the process of dying. So as I mentioned, when someone is dying from chronic illness, organ failure, Uh, a disease like cancer, something that causes a gradual death over time, there are very significant signs that we can witness that tell us that dying is happening. It's a slow process and gradually each organ system in the body begins to shut down very slowly, begins to fail in how it's operating. So the signs of the dying process beginning can be evident as much as two to four months before a person actually dies. So as I was describing, it can be a slow and gradual process. And at that earlier point in the dying process, there are some changes that happen. Oftentimes, it's a decrease in interest in eating. And patients may just say they're not hungry or they have lost interest in food. And actually, they may not be able to handle food the same way they could in the past. Their digestive system may be shutting down, may not be able to digest certain foods well. So eating habits may change. Patients may eat less often and less food each time that they eat, and they may no longer want foods that they used to really enjoy and really like. It's important to know this because sometimes when we're caring for someone who is at the very end of life, we may feel the most important thing we could help them do is to eat. And we associate eating, of course, with good health and vitality and vibrancy, but it's important that we recognize that sometimes for patients at the end of life, 
eating can make them feel worse if they eat the foods that their body isn't ready to handle at that time. So it's important to listen to what the patient is expressing to us. Always offer them food, but listen carefully to what things sound good to them or what they feel they're able to eat and not experience a lot of discomfort afterward. Also, sleep habits may change quite a bit during this time. People may begin to start sleeping more at night and more often during the day, taking naps, which can extend for longer and longer periods of the day. They may actually have some difficulty sleeping at night and become a bit restless and wake up frequently at night. But there will definitely be a gradually increasing amount of time the person is spending sleeping. Also, during this period, there will be a decrease in interest in social interactions. And so the patient may be very slowly and gradually withdrawing from others, less interested in the activities that they used to enjoy that involve other people. They may not be wanting as many visitors or spending as much time socializing. So it's important to be aware of that change as well, because sometimes we think the best thing we could do for someone is is show up and be there and give them company and distraction. But there can clearly be a change as the person begins their gradual process toward dying when they're just not as interested in talking to people and socializing. This is because the person is being drawn within somewhat during this time to start to look at internal issues as they prepare for actually dying. And so they need more of their time and energy to spend on these changes that are happening within them that they may not be able to talk about. They may not understand what's happening well enough to tell you. It's just that you might observe that suddenly family game night or watching television together is of less interest to the patient. And that's a normal change that happens. So not something to be worried about. Then around one to three weeks before dying occurs, there are some significant changes that happen. And this becomes a time when some of some people refer to this as the labor of dying begins in earnest. And so there's a great time of preparation for actual death to occur. During this time, the patient will be sleeping most of the time. So their periods of being awake will be much more limited. And most of the time they'll be sleeping. And during that time, a lot of inner work is happening from what patients tell us. There are things are being processed. Memories are being reviewed. Sometimes they're working on forgiveness and tying up loose ends and they're they're getting insights into themselves and who they are as people and so we may see physical changes like irregular breathing while the person is sleeping breathing may stop and there might be pauses you know for a few seconds to several seconds at a time and uh, their breathing just may not sound normal to us, but that is a normal process. Again, much less interest in food. Some patients may completely stop eating during this time and may only desire sweet foods or ice cream or something that to us doesn't sound healthy. But again, it's important to honor the wishes of that person because they're listening to their own body and what their body needs at that time. When we examine patients during this phase, this labor phase of the dying process, we notice changes in blood pressure and heart rate. Body temperature can fluctuate and go up and down. The skin color begins to change. We can see modeling at times on the legs, which is where um, there's irregular coloration of the legs. We see uh, various physical changes happening, and they can seem like they're advancing rather rapidly during this time. And as I said, it could be from one to three weeks before death occurs. So again, remember that food consumption will be very low during this time, and that's normal and natural. And the labor that's happening 
from what we understand and know during this time is that the patient is really preparing to leave the physical body behind. Now, I'm speaking from a frame of reference of viewing that there is more to a person than just a physical body. There is a consciousness that resides within the body, but that is preparing itself to separate from the body and leave the body behind. And many patients have talked about that to me. One of my dear friends, Mary Lou, who I saw many, many times as she was approaching dying and all throughout her process of illness, And Mary Lou was very spiritual. She had done so much work on herself in terms of love and forgiveness and making amends and healing all of her relationships. She had a very good attitude about dying. She was prepared. She knew that it would happen. She had her family and children with her. And she told me a few days before she died that what she had been experiencing over the last couple of weeks was she described this as a feeling of dissolving away. And she said this with the most radiant, luminous smile on her face and just pure, pure light coming from her. And she whispered it to me and she said, my physical body is dissolving away. That's how it feels. So this is what I understand as part of that separation process, consciousness is leaving behind the physical body a little bit at a time over this one to three weeks. And there's less and less attachment to being a physical organism and more and more sense of being consciousness itself, being a spirit, not a physical body. And from what Mary Lou and other patients have described to me, it is not painful. It's not necessarily frightening if you have some of understanding of what's happening. I have had some patients who have been afraid during this stage of life, partly because they weren't prepared to die at all. They hadn't thought about it. They hadn't done any kind of reading or spiritual and emotional preparation for this event happening. That's one reason why planning ahead for the end of life is so important. And also engaging with a hospice care team, if you have someone who's dying in this gradual way, to have people there who can give lots of education and information and support to the person who's dying to understand what this process is like and what's actually happening. This is a time in the dying process also when the patient may begin having visions. They may begin seeing spectral visions of loved ones who are coming to visit them. They may hear voices of loved ones talking to them. They may simply be aware of things they've never seen before. And again, for some people that can be frightening. For others, it's comforting. And for others, it doesn't seem scary or or unfamiliar to them. It actually feels very positive and gives them a sign that there are souls waiting for them and that they will not be alone when they die, that there will be others who have died before who will be present when they're leaving their body. So it's very common for patients to have these visions, also to have dreams on the deathbed of Again, of being visited by others, but also dreams of the past where they're being shown the reality of how things were. They're being shown the deeper meaning of things in life. This is a really profound and significant time. I've seen patients make huge transformations during this time of healing and love and connecting with others and awakening in a sense to understanding what their life was all about and finding meaning. It's a, it's an incredible time. So it's so valuable if you can be at the bedside and observe the process, if, but also if you can help support the person through this process and let them know that the things they're experiencing are normal, a natural part of dying to help take away their fear and to help validate for them that, 
they're simply experiencing the natural process of dying as it unfolds little by little. And then that brings us up to the very last days and hours of life. And this can be one or two days. It could be a few hours or a few minutes. And we call this the active dying phase, which is when the person generally becomes non-responsive. It appears that they're in a coma, though we know that hearing remains intact. They can hear everything that's happening around them, what we say to them and what we say to each other when we're in the room with them. And patients who have been non-responsive, even for a few days, sometimes also have moments when they get an occasional surge of energy and can wake up and speak to other people. Sometimes they sit up in bed. This is called terminal lucidity. When they they suddenly become awake, what I've witnessed is sometimes they have a message that they want to share with other people. Sometimes we don't understand necessarily what it means or what they're trying to tell us, but I've seen it happen when patients who had been in this non-responsive state suddenly, suddenly sit up and say something one man said to his family, and I was there to witness it, don't say it if you don't mean it. And then he laid down again and went, became non-responsive again and never said another word. But that message, I took that message to heart because I felt like if he came out of his, his terminal comatose state in order to say those words, that's something important that he was being inspired to say. And I wanted to remember that. So in fact, that has been something that comes to my mind all the time. Be careful with your words. Don't say it if you don't mean it. Anyway, this is an interesting experience. If you're with someone who's dying and they have this moment of terminal lucidity, sometimes I've had families get very confused and think, wait a minute, does this mean my loved one isn't dying, that they're actually fine, they're, they're going to wake up now? But no, this can happen as part of this very normal process that is taking place. And usually the patient lays down again, they go right back into their more comatose, non-responsive state. So during this time, we see a lot of changes in the physical body. There can be more discoloration in the skin. Sometimes the fingers and hands and feet can turn a dark, dusky color because they're not getting enough oxygen. The extremities can become somewhat cold. The patient can be restless. There can be um, picking at the clothes or the sheets on the bed. There can be grimacing of the face or sometimes some patients moan and appear to be uncomfortable, though from everything that we've been able to study, this happens whether or not there is pain associated to the process. So it's not necessarily a sign of pain and discomfort. It may be a sign of this work, very challenging work that is taking place on the interior, as I described before, of separation of consciousness from the physical body. And of course, during this time, the patient will no longer be eating or drinking. And Sometimes there's a concern on the part of family members that the patient needs water, but in fact, the process of dehydration is also part of of the natural dying process. The body becomes dehydrated as it is dying, and the patient may not be able to process or utilize water if they're if it's given to them and it's not necessarily what they need though we usually do mouth care to make sure the tongue and the membranes of the mouth and the lips don't become too dry and cracked and uncomfortable so we have swabs that we can use to keep the mouth moist because that adds to the comfort for the patient, but it's best if we don't treat with IV fluid or try to give the patient sips of water, which can cause choking and aspiration and actually make things worse instead of better. So 
good care of the mouth to keep it hydrated and then allowing that natural process of dehydration to occur. I mentioned before that patients these last few days of life, uh, they're non-responsive. They are often not verbal, but occasionally they will they will sometimes mumble or say things during this time, and, but they can hear us. And so if there's a message that you need to give to a person as they are dying, you can talk to them. You can tell them what you need to say. But remember that they're engaged in this deep inner process of working on separating the consciousness from the physical body. And so it may not be a time when they're necessarily needing us to say anything to them, although it's perfectly fine to tell them what you need to say, to say, I love you, I forgive you, I'm here for you, whatever you might need to say. But recognize that they're withdrawn from you so you may not see any sign whatsoever that they've heard you or that it made any difference to them. And mostly we believe patients don't really need a lot from us at that time in terms of communication. But they will be aware of our presence. They will hear our voice that will most likely bring support to them during this, these last few days of life, but don't feel pressured to provide ongoing commentary or even to read to this person because it's possible that they really want to be focusing only on, on what's happening within and a lot of stimulation from outside of them may slow down their process of doing the inner work that they're trying to work on. It may be distracting in a sense. So it depends on your relationship with the person and perhaps what you need to do in order to feel comfortable at the time if you're with someone who's dying. So as far as for the patient who is dying, this is a process that happens and the patient doesn't necessarily speed it up or slow it down. It happens in its own time frame. It varies a great deal from one person to the next. It may depend on how much work that person needs to do or what is being completed within them during the dying process could be related to whatever their underlying illness is, how long the dying process takes, but it tends to be very unique. So two patients with the same disease will not have the same dying process. So I'm telling you some of the most common occurrences during the dying process, but I want to also tell you that when patients have become lucid, during the last few weeks of life and what they have talked about and told me is, as I already mentioned, um, my friend Mary Lou told me she felt like she was dissolving. She also described this amazing feeling of love that she was experiencing when she was in her unresponsive states, that she was surrounded with pure love and pure light, and it was beautiful, and it was wonderful. And she felt no fear whatsoever. She also did not feel sad. She felt that this was the right thing. It's what should be happening. It's what she was ready for. It, it was perfect for how her life had unfolded in spite of the fact that she was leaving behind her husband and two children. And so many patients have communicated that to me as well, that they felt at peace, they felt pure love, they, they were surrounded by beautiful light, and that experiencing this process felt right to them no matter how they got there, no matter what the disease process was that brought them to that point. It felt like it was the perfect resolution somehow to the lives they had lived. So hearing these stories over and over again from my patients who were able to to describe what was happening and to be lucid enough for moments here and there to talk about it has helped me tremendously throughout my life to have less fear of dying. And 
actually to kind of really let go of being afraid of dying. I mean, it's going to happen no matter what. And I don't want to spend my time worrying about it or feeling frightened or anxious about what might happen at that time. But to understand that it appears to be a peaceful, loving process, particularly if you allow it to happen and don't resist it. The patients who seem to be fighting and pushing against death are the patients I have seen who have a more difficult time, experience more pain, more distress during their dying process. So just something to remember and to think about. And then I wanted to mention a little bit about sudden death when people die from a sudden event like a heart attack, stroke, or in an accident. And the information we have about a sudden death tends to come from people who have had near-death experiences, then have, have come back to consciousness in order to talk about it. And one of the people I learned about near-death experiences from was my own grandmother, though at the time she told me this story, I didn't know that it was a near-death experience. I didn't understand that. My grandmother was 84, and she had had, she was in the hospital because she had had a heart attack, and she had a cardiac arrest while in the hospital, so her heart completely stopped her breathing stopped. And she told me that she felt herself lifting out of her body, she was able to look down on her body. And that she was in a place where there was, just like Mary Lou described this incredible light surrounding her, and it was beautiful. And there was nothing but love there. And she felt so happy, and she felt like she was at home. And she experienced that for a few moments or a minute or so. And then suddenly she felt this horrific jolt in her chest and sudden pain occurring, which is when they uh, use the defibrillator to start her heart again after her cardiac arrest. And so she woke up after that and all of the light and the love faded away. She was in a, in a hospital room with lots of noise and people rushing around and pushing on her chest and, and all kinds of, of hectic activity happening all around her. And she was very sad that she had to leave that place of love and light. And she told this to us, her family, because she said, please don't let them do that to me ever again. Please don't let them resuscitate me. Please let me stay there if it happens to me again, which indeed it did. She did die after a cardiac arrest in the hospital, and we were able to stop them from resuscitating her the, this, the last time that it happened. But I took from her story, as I've looked back at that and looked at Mary Lou's story and other patient stories, that even patients who die very suddenly in the moment experience this similar feeling of light and love all around them. And they tell me that they do not have pain or fear when it, when it happens to them. And other people who've talked about other types of dying experiences have said the same thing, that they enter a state where there's no pain, there's, there's no fear or anger or hatred or anxiety when they enter into that state. So I also take great comfort from hearing those stories. And there are many people right now telling their near-death experience stories. There are a lot on YouTube you can listen to, which are really fascinating. And some of them are very long and involved and they journey to a different place. They encounter beings where they are and really fascinating to listen to. Also, I, I find all of them reassuring, but they also fit with experiences I've had in my own life, dreams I've had, visions I've had, things that I, I have just seen and experienced in a spiritual manner. And so... Can I actually answer the question, what is it like to die? I cannot because I haven't died myself. 
I cannot say from my own personal experience what it will feel like for me. I'm sharing all this information with you to tell you what I've witnessed and observed in my medical life and in my spiritual life as well, because I think it's really important that, first of all, we come to terms with the fact that we're mortal and that all of us will die one day. So this is something all of us we'll find out about in our own time. But I think it's important for life that we learn to grow beyond our fear and anxiety about death so that we can live life with more comfort, more peace, more love, more joy, more fully while we're here. I think living life in that way can help all of us detach from life more easily when it is our time to die. And that's It's part of something that I believe as I've witnessed people dying is this process of detaching from life requires us to be able to surrender and to be able to let life go. And I think it's easier to let go of a life that we feel really good about, that we feel like, wow, I did everything I wanted to do. I worked at it really hard. And of course, we may be very sad that we're we're leaving life behind. But if we have a sense that I, I was awake, I paid attention, I was aware of what was happening around me, and I did the best I could with this life, I think it may be easier to surrender and easier to let go. And that labor process of separating consciousness from the body may happen a little more quickly with more ease. So as I said before, it's the people who have not prepared, who have not thought about it, who actually have shoved death out of their mind and never wanted to discuss it, never wanted to acknowledge that they are mortal. Those are the people who I've seen have a greater struggle when they are in their last hours and days of life. And I have seen some people who linger for weeks, partly because I think it's so very hard for them to let go and to leave the physical life behind. So I want to talk about it and encourage you to think about it, read about it, study about it so that you will feel, will feel less afraid when it is your time to face the very end. And so until next week, I'll come back with another topic next week, I promise. And until then, remember that we're here for love. So the, the fail-safe approach is always focus on love. And try to find as much love as you can in life and bring as much love to life as you can. Face your fear, especially your fear of death. Be ready for whatever life brings to you because it's full of surprises. And love each and every moment of your precious life. Mm -hmm.